John chapter number 20 is the account of the resurrection. As you may have heard me say many times before, uh, you have four different accounts of the resurrection by uh, eyewitness folks. Uh, it is uh, considered, or folks who literally wrote down uh, the accounts of these uh, particular experiences. And so John was one of the last written gospels, the last written accounts of the experience they had with Jesus, uh, particularly throughout the course of Jesus' life. Uh, if you were here the last couple of weeks, you heard me talk about how Jesus literally had about three years to make a convincing proof that he was who he said he was, that he was a unique individual, uh, someone who had never uh, literally walked the face of the earth. Uh, John was attempting to underscore that Jesus was more than just a human being. Jesus was God and man or hum human in the flesh. And here we find this particular passage of scripture that captures the immediate aftermath of Jesus' death. And what's so fascinating about this particular passage, if you've been here a couple of weeks, uh, the central figure in this passage uh, is Mary, Mary Magdalene. Um, she is uh, one of the first uh, followers of Jesus to show up at the tomb uh, in the morning uh, to report, to find out that Jesus was uh, literally uh, ra raised from the dead. But if you were hanging out with us a couple of weeks ago uh, and I preached the Lazarus text, and many of you may recall that Mary Magdalene was thought to also have been one of the first disciples to actually say that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was literally the one they had been waiting for. Uh, it does, again, if you read this text uh, with uh, some decolonized eyes, uh, you will find that uh, the prominence of women, particularly women who may not uh, be uh, considered uh, at the center of social uh, status, were always hanging around Jesus. And I just be wondering sometimes, which Jesus some folk be following? Because it's like if, if folks on the margins seem to love hanging around Jesus, then what happened to us? Amen. Why, why are folks so uncomfortable hanging out with us if they find themselves on the social margins? But Jesus, when he was here, these folks seem to ran to Jesus. Makes me just hope that folk run into some of us up in here running to us and not away from us. Amen? All right, we're going to read uh, a little bit, uh, particularly because it's Resurrection Sunday, and I'm going to try not to editorialize too much because I would love to let the preaching do the uh, illuminating of the text. But in verse number one, the scripture says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, everybody say, while it was still dark, was still dark. Mary Magdalene, again, Mary Magdalene was considered to be uh, someone who was perhaps a sex worker or someone who literally uh, was uh, um, um, uh, in relationships with lots of other individuals to make their lives work during this time. All right. So Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple and the one whom Jesus loved. That's the apostle John and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb, and the two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him, went into the tomb, saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. Everybody say that, and he saw, and he, saw. And, he and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures, and say that, they did not understand, they did not understand. The, scripture, the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home. Somebody say they went back home. 
All right, here comes Mary Magdalene again. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, the angels, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they, talking about grave diggers or the empire or the soldiers, somebody has taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Mm -hmm. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping for whom are you looking supposing Jesus to be the gardener now that's interesting <laughs> sometimes you'd be looking for something that's right under your nose amen you just be it's just too good to be true but she says to him sir if you have carried Jesus away tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away Jesus said to her Mary she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabunai, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that... He had said these things to her. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So on today, I'm going to share for the next, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes or so, what death could not kill. What death could not kill. Bow your heads with me. Father, we say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say, thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Now, one of the most important parts of resurrection, I believe, of Easter is to live in the tension of both its spiritual impact and its impact for our lives outside the context of church going. Uh, for some, to over-spiritualize the death and resurrection of Jesus uh, leads you to evacuate the political and material impact of Christ's work in the world and creation and even perhaps on and in and with your neighbor but to under spiritualize or to lose the spiritual impact of what the death and resurrection of jesus means is to steal the impact the emphasis the need for the divine act of love that God demonstrates through the miraculous power at work in the resurrection. I mean, I want you and I to be a people, as we often say, who is not so heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. But I also want us to be mindful that there is a part of our construction that needs some kind of spiritual renewal. Uh, it is indeed the case that one of the most powerful impulses of the early church was that they, talking about the early Christians, emphasized not the cross as much as they emphasized resurrection. If you were to take a look at some of the earliest accounts of uh, the followers of, as they called it back then, the way. They weren't called Christians at their earliest designation. They were called followers of the way. It was a, a, a powerful uh, assu assuming of 
Christ's resurrecting power that made them stand up to the persecution they were receiving from the Roman Empire. You know, many people were being crucified during that time. They would crucify you if you didn't pay your taxes. Uh, some of us would be in trouble. Somebody say amen, right? They would crucify you if you, you know, uh, you know claimed uh, some allegiance to another uh, political leader outside of the emperor. And it seemed like some folk are trying to bring that back with Trump. Amen, right? It, it, it's, it's like the conditions of that day led all kinds of people to experience capital punishment. But what was so compelling to the uh, you know, folks who were not necessarily following the ways of Jesus was that you had these ragtag followers who were literally willing to die without renouncing their faith. And what had them willing to die? You know, I don't know how many of you would die for a lie. Amen. You know, I, if, you know, I, I feel like I'm one of these people who can be pretty stubborn and don't like to admit I'm wrong, even with new information, praise God. But I don't know if you throw me in a, in a, in a, in a coliseum with some lions, tigers, and bears, I'm probably going to change my mind real quick. Be like, oh, this ain't all that serious. Mm -hmm. But these early Christians were so convinced about what they saw, and not just what they saw, but they were so convinced that if the Spirit raised Jesus from the dead, then they themselves were able to tap into something that literally, listen, stole the fear of dying from them. That kind of valor became legendary. Before Constantine came in and, you know, used the imperial powers of, of, of his, his, his rule to, to, to force Christianity as a part of their military conquest, there were literally uh, folk who were saying that I'm willing to die because I have lost the fear of death because the person who I am believing in figured out a way to get up again. Now, I want you to think about what would your life look like if you really believed death did not have the final say? How differently would you and I live in a society in a time where we have literally been overwhelmed by the ubiquitous presence of death. Many of us have lost loved ones during COVID. Many of us are constantly being bombarded by the tragedies of shootings. And, and we've seen even in Tennessee, uh, a whole new group of young people are raising up, channeling the energy of our ancestors with a righteous indignation. And they're not stuttering, praise God. They, 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 they channeling something that's, that's, that's making some of us who've grown a little tired get a little more energy, right? Because sometimes there is a power greater than yourself that can cause you to turn off the button that makes you so risk averse. Can you imagine how you would live in this world if we weren't so dominated by fear? Fear of one another. Fear of losing what you have. Fear of someone else taking what you possess. Fear of being hurt again. Fear of being abandoned or misunderstood. Fear of things you don't fully understand. And so you hoard and rely on your own machinations or your own tools. Sadly, sometimes weapons to hoard off that which you fear. I want you to know that one of the great gifts for we who believe in resurrection is, as Jesus told the folks who came and met him at the tomb, fear not. That fear need not be a part of 
your life's experience to the point where you are calculating your next move because you're afraid you may lose something. What is it that death could not kill? I want to, uh, I want to encourage you to imagine that there are some things that death can only kill if you stay paralyzed in fear. But on this resurrection morning, I want you to imagine that God wants to help you shed some fear today. God wants to help you get free from the, the frustrations that keep you from taking the next step. Because you know that that's a risk over there. But I want to surmise and suggest to you that there's a risk if you do nothing as well. You could risk missing out on the biggest surprise you ever could imagine. You could risk losing the opportunity to have your mind blown. You could risk learning something new mm -hmm. that could help you move forward in your life. Four things real quick that I want to lift up that I think uh, is so important for you and I coming from this text that death cannot kill. The first thing that I want you to appreciate, if we're going to shed our fear, death cannot kill our act of solidarity. <clears throat> Somebody holler, stand with me. Matter of fact, better, better, better yet, uh, tell, tell the person next to you, show up for me. Now, now here in verse number one, you see that Mary Magdalene, now again, you know, I love, you know, the way that, that, that I'm, you know, being a little rewired to read some of these texts, you know, uh, the womenist uh, 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 theological frameworks are very powerful. Uh, they're emerging in our theological discourse. And so Mary, and you know, previously Mary and Martha, man, I, I was telling y'all, was it last week or the week before, that Mary and Martha was some gangsters. Mary and Martha harboring fugitives. They had to be some bad women because you don't see no men around. They must have been the Amazons before the Amazons showed up. Somebody say amen. <laughs> Mary and Martha. Mary Magdalene was one of these women who figured out that her proximity to Jesus, her remaining in solidarity with Jesus, would outlast the death of Jesus. She shows up at the tomb, the scripture says, early in the morning, before it became light, so it was still dark. She shows up, even though in her mind and her experience and what she saw with her eyes, Jesus was dead. Mary, along with all the disciples, experienced an act of death. And yet they were still compelled to show up for one another, even in the act of death. Death cannot kill your ability to show up for one another. Now, it's important to appreciate in this story that it was a risk for Mary Magdalene. Now, remember again, as I said, she was a sex worker, so she was not the most kind of, you know, embraceable figure during her day. So, you know, I'm sure there were some folks grumbling about why Mary keep hanging around Jesus. I'm sure some of his disciples, you know, some of us church folk probably would be having a little lot of stuff to say about that too. But Mary refused to be ran off because she understood that Jesus showed up for me, so I'm going to keep showing up for him. And Trip, she showed up, listen, while it was still dark. So there's a risk. Mm -hmm. How many there's a risk showing up for some people? Well, I wish I could talk to some real folk up in here. That's some rich showing up some folk in your family. Like, oh, Pastor Mike, you don't know my family now. There's some rich showing up some folk in the neighborhood. There's some rich showing up some people on your job. There's some rich showing up for Pookie and Ray Ray in there. There's some rich showing up for your, your family members who's incarcerated. 
for your queer loved one. There's a risk showing up for folk who don't fit into the boxes of social acceptance. But when you are a resurrected person, you have power to show up for people through the power of God's spirit. Only if you can shed some of your fear. Uh, pat yourself on the chest and say, I got to show up for somebody. Amen. And, and the great thing about being in solidarity is that when you show up for folk, there's a reciprocal nature of the universe that people will start showing up for you. Anybody had somebody show up for you? Amen. So, somebody just popped up. You didn't even expect it. I want you to know that one of the hallmarks of following Jesus in this time, I believe, is we have to prioritize showing up for people. Not just the people you like. Not just the people with power and titles. But you got to learn to show up for people. Listen, while it is gloomy. While it is risky. And the great thing is when you show up, God usually sends a crowd of people to show up with you. So you're not showing up alone. I can't preach this as long as I want to because, you know, uh, it's Easter Sunday. And I know some of y'all, your clock is ticking and so is mine. So let me, let me give you the first, the first question. What fears must we shed to ensure we show up for one another? It's just a question for you to think about on Easter Sunday while you're on your way to Easter brunch. Amen. Give me 10 minutes and I'll have you on your way. Or conversely, where do you need solidarity in your own life and who are the people that are showing up for you maybe one of your prayers today is on this resurrection Sunday God I need you to help me show up for some folk and conversely I need folk to show up for me operative phrase while it is still dark Whew. The second thing that I think the scripture lifts up that is important for you to appreciate what death cannot kill. Death cannot kill the process. God's process in your life. Listen, verse number nine. I, I got captivated by this verse. I almost said I'm just going to preach this verse next week. And I may, I may, but I had to just drop it on you just in case you don't make it back. So you can understand that death can't kill your process. Verse number nine, this is what the scripture says. The disciple, this is the male disciple now, Peter or John, who got there late, but they still got there, so don't trip if you're late. <laughs> just come. Tell your neighbor, just come. He got there after the sister, but he got there. And listen, the scripture says he saw and believed. But listen, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. I ran by that passage real quick, and then I got stuck, and I said, wait a second. The scripture says that he saw and he believed, but he still did not understand the scripture. And then he went back home. He saw he believed, he did not understand the scripture, and then he went back home. He experienced an act of death, but he still saw, he still believed, he still did not understand, and he still went back home. The process, your process, means that you will increase in your belief, even when you don't fully understand everything. I'm talking about the process now. You don't have to understand everything in order to have a belief. And trip, you're going to have to keep living. You have to go home. <laughs> Hello, somebody. 
They saw. They believed. They did not understand. They went home. You're going to have to keep believing. You're going to have to keep learning while you keep living. Death won't stop you from believing. Let me say that death does not have to stop you from believing. Death does not have to stop you from learning. Death show sure enough ought not stop you from living. I want you to know, beloved, that truth is knowable. It is within our grasp. There are things that you can learn if you keep living. If you keep searching for truth, you can find revelation through creation or through special spiritual enlightenment. But the key here, listen, is to resist fundamentalism while you go down a path towards learning. Because when you become too fundamentalist in your learning process, rather than you being open to new ideas, you become closed to new ideas. And when your mind is too closed, you will never learn what God wants to show you. We don't wear choir robes anymore. You know, because, you know, we progressive, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but I believe all of our faith in here should fit like a choir robe. Choir robes are not tailor fit for the person who wears them. There was a time where, you know, I used to wear tailored suits and then, you know, kept living. A suit that is tailored to every contour of my body leaves very little room for me to keep living. <laughs> Somebody say amen. If your faith is too tailored to your present condition, you have no room to keep living. I want you to understand that COVID, losing your job, loss of relationships, loved ones, money. If your faith is too tailored, you may not have space for you to keep believing learning and living but if you can make some room in your journey I think God will show you something that will allow you to see what you saw believe what you can understand hold out for what you can't understand and go back home and keep living Last thing I'll say, death cannot kill God showing up for you. Somebody say divine surprises. That, that, that's what death cannot kill. The scripture says again in verse number 14, that Mary who has shown up to be in solidarity with Jesus is weeping and crying because she feels like someone has taken something so precious to her. I don't know what Mary was going to do with a dead body by herself. I don't know. But she sure was hung up on that body. Like, where, where's, where's the body at? Somebody done took Jesus. I was coming here to, I don't know, do some spices. I don't know, sit, vigil. I don't know, I, but, but I can't even do it. Even though she had been told beforehand that he was going to 
rise from the dead. You know, some of us be like, man, why she, didn't she believe? Because we don't believe. Just, just, I want you, you know, all of us, you know, who've been Christianized, socialized, you know, we, 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 we don't have the wonder in the scripture, you know. You know, it's, 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 it's like, you know, if I were to tell you that I'm going to, you know, uh, die tomorrow, but I'll be here next Sunday. <laughs> Some of y'all be like, please, Pastor, don't come next Sunday. <laughs> if, if you dead, just, 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 just stay, just do, stay there. If I go to your funeral and we see you get put in the ground and you pop up here on the next day, <laughs> I don't care what you told me, praise God. I don't, I don't, I don't want that. I, I didn't ask for that. Can we keep it real up in here? Jesus told his disciples a lot of stuff that they did not believe until they saw it with their own eyes. And it's so powerful to me that the, the, the power of resurrection is that Jesus loves to surprise you. There is a divine surprise waiting for all of us. I don't know when it's going to pop up. I don't know what death situation you're going to have to endure. I don't know what kind of loss, what kind of betrayal, what kind of trauma. But there is a moment in your life. Where the preacher and the therapist and your mom and them and all of them folk ain't going to be able to do the resurrecting surprise that Jesus can do. The scripture says that Jesus shows up and says, Mary, and she's still crying about a dead body. I just wonder how many times we've prayed for things. And the answer to our prayer is not what we thought it would look like. But the longer you encounter and engage with God, you start to see that God knows how to meet you in your grief, in your inquiries, in your vocation, in your relationships, in your disappointments, in your highs and in your lows. C.S. Lewis says it like this, that God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. That pain is the megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And I believe, given the moment we are in, I can't speak to another era because I didn't live in that era. And folks always, oh, if I was, you, man, I could never be a slave. Oh, I'd just be dead and buried in my grave. Oh, I could never, oh, they call me the, oh, I, you know, everybody talk about what you would do in a time you're not. <laughs> I, if I was the president of the United States, I, and you'd never be the president. <laughs> oh, if I was the CEO of my company, you'd I mean, you got to come to work on time first before you get you know, So I say amen, right? We always talk about we would do if, right? Rather than realizing where you are right now is where you likely are, are, are on the precipice of experiencing a divine surprise. And that's what resurrection to me is about. It's about not allowing death to have the final say. About what God is up to. Now, there is a finality to death. Physical death. Death of relationships. Death of your career. De there, there's some finality to that, but it is not a final finality. What if it was a semicolon rather than a period? What if, as Jesus told Mary Magdalene, I'm not asking you to stay here wondering about my body. I want you to go back now and be a witness. Go tell everybody else that you had an experience and you now have been deputized to share and continue the message and the method. Fred Hampton said it like this, you can kill a revolutionary, 
but you can't kill the revolution. You can kill a messenger, but you can't kill the message. The gospel according to Nipsey Hussle says what? The marathon continues. You don't have to stop because of death. You ought to pause. Take some time to grieve. Let your body, your mind, your spirit have an encounter with the healing power of God and all that God uses to heal us. How many know a therapist is a gift from God? Medicine, rightly prescribed. <laughs> it's a gift from God. Holy friends. Art. Nature. Community. It's a gift from God. God heals us. Do all of these things so death never has the final say. Stand with us, everybody. Let's take a few moments. I got some reflection questions they can put on the screen. That the song says, hallelujah. You have won the victory. I just want you to close your eyes just for a few moments. We won't be here long, but I don't want you to run past this opportunity to make a commitment to yourself that on this Resurrection Sunday, I will not let death, the period when it should be a comma, it should be a semicolon, it should be a pause. Because death can't hold you down. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can raise us from our dead places. Give us an opportunity to begin again. God, I pray for my loved one in this room today who may be, even on this Resurrection Sunday, caught between all the different experiences in this passage. They may be struggling to see life after death. They may be struggling to ascertain the process you're taking them through to see, believe, understand, and keep living. They may lack solidarity with others or Others may lack solidarity with them, but I pray today, God, that this Resurrection Sunday, we can be in a collective space of openness for how you will surprise us. Somebody say, surprise me, Lord. Say it again, surprise me, Lord. Surprise me with life. Surprise me with second chances. Surprise me with new beginnings. Thank you, Jesus. Surprise me with hope and joy and peace and healing surprise me Lord and remind me death could not hold you down you are the risen king seated in majesty seated in majesty
Resurrection Sunday. I tell you just to reach up and just grab resurrection grab all of it that you need it's an act of faith it's symbolic but I believe that sometimes God moves when we move God responds to our acts of faith so God I receive resurrection I receive new life I receive reciprocity in my relationships I receive solidarity I receive the process that you're leading me through I receive God that the message will always outlast the messenger and the revolution will always outlast the revolutionary. That the marathon will always continue because I will keep running this race that you've put before me and I'll do it to the glory of God. And we'll say thank you God. In Jesus name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them you are an overcomer. Tell them that you are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. You are an overcomer. Now give the Lord a hand praise up in here, everybody. God bless you, people of the way. Listen. I want to invite our loved ones to come on stage with these flowers. Y'all come here, let me, let me just give, give us a quick, a quick, yeah, come on, come on up, let me just, we, we, we want you to leave with a gift, a little, what are these things called, Suc succulents, we want you to be reminded on Resurrection Sunday that your process will always continue. So on your way out the door, they're gonna have, they'll have them at each door entrance. Uh, we'll invite you to, to capture one of those. If you have a child or a young person in our children's church, before you take your family portrait or before you do anything, we need you to run over there real fast and retrieve your child. I think they've done the egg roll or they're getting ready to do the egg roll, but we need you to go get your child. Somebody say amen. Because we don't want no problems. You get him after I say the last prayer. Trust the process. Amen. That your child is ready for you to come pick him up. But more importantly, we want you to come back and hang out with us. Wasn't it great to be in the house of God together? Amen. I hope that you find resurrection in the course of your life. New beginnings, new hope, new strength new love, new life, new opportunities, find it. It's waiting for you in the name of the Lord. We have two family portrait settings, one in here, one in the back. Feel free to sign up or hang out and get your family portrait taken. But more than anything, love on one another on this Easter Resurrection Sunday. Is that all right? Come on, bow your heads and let's pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the gift of this day. Thank you that you are a God that keeps reminding us that death does not have the final say and that we are resurrected people because Jesus is risen. Yes, he is risen indeed. Bless us as we leave this place, but never your presence and bring us back at that appointed time. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. 
hug two or three people or give them a high five or elbow bump and tell them I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord.